my name kept being submitted to the governor's office, but I wasn't getting the nod. So in 1980, I decided to run for a county court vacancy. It was a five-person race. It was, fortunately, I was elected in 1980 and took office in January of 81. My first assignment was county traffic. Well, I walked in to the courtroom that first day and I couldn't believe all the people. By the end of my first week, I saw over a thousand people in traffic court. It was mind-boggling. They didn't have hearing officers in those days. I served as a county judge for five years doing criminal, civil, small claims, traffic, and uh, I then decided to try to become a circuit judge. You went through the same process with uh, the Judicial Nominating Commission. This time we had a new governor, Martinez, and uh, the first time my name was submitted, I got the appointment. So my first day on the job as a circuit judge, it's a resentencing on a murder one where the state was seeking the death penalty. I said, my gosh, if I can just get through this week, I'm sure I can do anything. And we did get through the week, and uh, I've been, as a circuit judge, been on the civil, the criminal, the administrative assignment, and uh, I, I guess the, the most time I've put in on the bench has been as a judge presiding in the career criminal division. We had great jurists, both in Clearwater and in St. Petersburg. They just made an extremely favorable impression upon me, and I decided that's what I would aspire to be, a judge. I think of Judge Athanason and Judge Beach and uh, Judge B.J. Driver and Judge Fogel. Um, they were some of the senior jurists at the time. Uh, they always had time uh, to spend with a young attorney imparting some uh, bits of wisdom. I guess I took bits and pieces from all of them, and uh, when I became a judge, uh, I developed my own style that was probably bits and pieces borrowed from many of these judges. As a judge, you're a nonpartisan, so we had friends that were in politics in the Republican Party, friends that were in politics in the Democratic Party, and you had to be very careful. Uh, not to associate at a lot of events that we previously uh, enjoyed. Additionally, uh, you could no longer socialize with some of the attorneys because then people would assert that you needed to recuse yourself from their cases. So as a judge, many times you become rather isolated and you become restricted to socializing with just judges and uh, perhaps the uh, academic world. And after I became a judge, I enjoyed teaching uh, at the junior college. I uh, taught local government law at Stetson, and uh, I became involved as an instructor at the National Judi Judicial College in Reno, Nevada. And so that became an interest of mine, uh, kind of an outlet from the bench. The most important lesson for any judge is that you are probably one of the most powerful elected officials in the state. Think about it. When you look at commercials at election time, you're looking at people running for the Senate or the presidency or the governorship uh, or the House or the county commission. But not one of those individuals can affect your life more directly than a judge can. A judge has the ability to take your freedom away from you. One of the most precious rights that we have as an American citizen. 
We can decide whether you get your children, whether you have visitation with your children. We preside over multi-million dollar pieces of litigation. And so this one person that can decide whether you have your children or not, have your freedom or not, have money or don't have money, obtain an inheritance or not, this one person called a judge can directly affect you as an individual. And so the most important lesson is be cognizant of that. I say to my fellow jurists, be cognizant of that at all times. Well, uh, of course, we've constantly expanded. Now, we probably have uh, 60 judges in our circuit alone. Uh, we have mediators. We have uh, hearing officers. Uh, we have diversionary programs to take people out of uh, the criminal arena. Uh, all these innovations have uh, freed up judicial time so that the current judges can address the uh, large number of cases. Uh, it allows the judges to do a better job. Another innovation that I see very prominent, and we take it for granted today, but something that definitely didn't exist when I started, was all the technology that we have in the courts. All of a sudden, we had videos to show to a jury. A picture is worth a thousand words. We have computers now where we have ready access to a case history or you have a, the ability to check a person's record or which division a case is in. I was put on a technology committee in the state of Florida, and so all the circuits would meet up in Tallahassee. We were the only circuit with apples, and we could do things that other circuits only dreamed about doing. And we became part of the entire state system, which uh, does not utilize apples, but we are linked. Every judge has a computer in chambers, in the courtroom. Uh, we have laptops to, to bring home if you want to do a little extra research. We are probably one of the most technologically advanced circuits in the state. We're very fortunate for that. We also have utilized uh, video conferencing for the taking of testimony. Think about a person literally on a deathbed being able to give testimony in a jury trial through the innovations that we have in our courtroom. And now we're going to electronic filings. We're trying to eliminate paper, and those are hard habits to break, but uh, someday, we will have attorneys appearing by video conference. Let's say an attorney has a practice in Tampa and it's just going to be a short hearing. He'll appear electronically. We'll see his figure on a screen and uh, we'll still be able to conduct court. And uh, gasoline will be saved and efficiency will be improved. Everyone, regardless of what their occupation is, endeavors to be as good as you can. And so, how do judges uh, meet this standard? We, we have uh, a continuing education process in our state. Uh, we have uh, a collegial group of judges and we con confer with one another on occasion and uh, it allows us all to do the best job that we possibly can. Well, uh, a while ago, one of the uh, probation officers from the Juvenile Justice Center 
uh, was in my courtroom for some reason and asked permission to bring some young people up from juvenile court that were possibly headed on the wrong track. So we decided to start having defense attorneys and prosecutors and me talk to these young people about how dangerous the sanctions were in circuit court. And so we uh, would tell them about what it's like to be locked up. Uh, I'd go around the room and ask them questions like, uh, what is your favorite soap, your favorite toothbrush, or your toothpaste, your favorite meal? Uh, do you have a brand of clothes that you like? And uh, we'd get quite a bit of participation, and then we'd tell them that, uh, Everyone in jail just wears a uniform. They really don't care so much about your name as your number. Uh, if you don't like the food that they're eating, I guess you don't eat. Uh, you have your freedom taken away from you when you're under lock and key. And I started to open. I'll never forget one day one of the defendants that I had just sentenced to uh, a long prison sentence, and he said to me, Judge, could I talk to these young people? And I said, you'll have to really watch your language because these people are young. He turned around and he stood at the podium and he looked at them, and this was the most heartfelt statement I heard a defendant ever say. And he said, I remember not too long ago when I was sitting where you are and someone that was on the bench was talking just like they're talking today. One thing, I wasn't listening. I hope you are. I've taken the wrong path. Don't take the path that I took. Listen to your moms and dads, listen to your teachers, and listen to people like Judge Luce because they're only trying to steer you clear of where I'm going. The young people that were in the courtroom really got a long-lasting uh, memory of that day in court. I, I think uh, from the old school, I enjoy formality in a courtroom. And uh, when people come into my courtroom, they know this that they will be prepared. They will act professionally. They will treat witnesses professionally. And uh, I will treat them professionally. They can expect that. They can also expect consistency. Uh, a sentence that I give to one person will be given to another person in like circumstances, regardless of who the attorney is, who the litigant is, who the prosecutor is, and uh, I think that it's good for people to know that when they come into a courtroom, they would expect that it will be run formally and properly. Uh, I see in uh, other courtrooms, not necessarily in this circuit, too much informality. With informality, I think the importance of the litigation before the court can be lost. Stay in close contact with your colleagues. Make sure that you can uh, take all as, as much continuing education as you can. Uh, look over those files. Be prepared when you take the bench. If you ever feel that you're blood pressure is rising after some episode in the courtroom, take a little stretch break, can collect your thoughts, and then when you go back in the courtroom, I'm sure that any decision that you make will be a well thought out, rational decision. As just a fair judge that uh, tried to do the best that he could one that uh, 
attorneys will, will recall was a stickler for formality, professionalism, preparedness when they entered the courtroom. And by employing those standards, everyone uh, hopefully achieved the result that they were seeking.